That that is true. Food is not medicine. But thank you for that intro. I'm so excited to be here, Ben. I'm excited to that you're here and you're pregnant. How many weeks along are you? Woo! I am uh, about to be 33 weeks. I'm I'm like real pregnant. Wow. Like, pregnant, pregnant. <laughs> <laughs> pregnant. That's pregnant, pregnant. Well, I'm thanks ready. for being here, even though you're carrying a baby inside of you right now. <laughs> we appreciate that. Absolutely. Um, you know, right off the bat, people are probably thinking, what do you mean food is not medicine? Um, that's what we heard all the time. Why do you believe that that's not necessarily true? I think, you know, I primarily, I've worked with men and women, um, and I primarily work with women right now. And what I have found is, first of all, there's an unhealthy relationship with food. There's this idea that, um, you know, if you know, you see it with vegans, you see it with carnivore. I'm like, I'm just going to hit everyone up, right? You see it with keto, but you, you teach it the right way, right? It's the act of putting our body under stress, our ability to become a fat burner and then to refeed, to introduce carbs and have an appropriate response. That's where we see the benefits. And why do we see the benefits? It's because of our innate, right? This idea, I, I've seen so many people, and we're going to come from an, a different perspective, right? We're coming from hormones, we're coming from thyroid hormones, which is going to be connected with sex hormones, which is going to be connected with adrenal hormones, right? And your body needs diversity in how you eat. But there's so many people that stick to the same way of eating because they lost weight, because they feel energy, they feel so much better, and it's because of keto. It's not because of keto. It's because your body is created to heal itself. Mm. It's because you shifted your metabolism. You gave your body this new form of fuel that it can use efficiently. You stuck to it. You changed to good nutrients. And because of that, now your body is created to function with that and heal itself. It's like saying this, right? It's like saying, you know, we were created with the foundation of good, like good fuel. That's what we need. We need good calories, good fuel to not just give us the energy we need, but to be the building blocks to our cell. When we start to deviate from the way we were created, we're going to become dysfunctional. When we go back to the way God created us to eat, to function, to move, to breathe, how we were meant to drink water, how we're meant to go outside, how we're meant to have our, our thought process, our body gets better. But is that all, all of that healing? You know, we are realigning with the way we were created to live. So it's not food, it's your body. The miracle isn't when you started fasting and all these things started changing or when you got into ketosis. The miracle is when you were created because you were given all that healing potential. The problem is you were lied to for most of your life and you were told that your body was this broken down machine and that it's only going to get worse with age. And if you have symptoms, that's just the way it is. And if you have a bad menstrual cycle, that's just being a woman. If you have low T, you just need to get, you know, injections or pellets. You've been lied to. And the idea is you got to remember healing comes from the inside out. That's why fasting, if food was medicine, if food was healing you, we wouldn't see the incredible healing and especially how fat, like how intensely it happens when we fast. Mm. It's in you. And what you're doing is you're working to realign yourself with the way we were created to eat, live, think, and move. So no, food is not medicine. <laughs> mm. Yeah, it makes total sense to me. Um, and I'm glad you brought up fasting because today's session, we haven't dove deep into fasting yet. And I wanted you to get into it, which we'll get into a little bit more. But yes, yeah, so you, you make a valid point. Innate is what heals mm -hmm. the body. Innate is the medicine. Innate intelligence is the world's greatest physician, healer, doctor, chiropractor. There's no yeah. supplement. There's no diet. There's no mm -hmm. pill, no surgery, no shot that could replace innate. Um, and exactly. if you think otherwise, it's only because we've been fed a whole bunch of lies. And speaking of yeah. which, when you were a teenager, you were fed a whole bunch of lies. You had some thyroid issues. And I'd love for you to share your story about the lies that you were told regarding your thyroid. Yeah. You know, we are living at a time and it was really bad 15 years ago. But this idea that, you know, if you have a problem with your hormones, if you have a problem with an organ system, you can just cut it out or medicate it, cut it out, medicate it or radiate it. I checked all three off by the time I was 20 years old, right? I I was having, first of all, I started off with gallbladder issues. I had a gallbladder attack at 16 years old, ended up in the emergency room, um, thought I was having a heart attack. But how does, you know, modern medicine right now deal with gallbladder? It's no big deal. Just cut it out, right? Oh, you don't need a gallbladder, which is false. You do need a gallbladder. It concentrates bile, releases it so you can break down fat and your nutrients, fat-soluble vitamins so that you can detox. But 
that happened to me first. And I thought, you know, this doesn't make sense to me, but no one really explained anything. It was this idea of just cut it out and you're good. You're fine. Even though I wasn't fine. And then three years later, I had this a massive nodule on my thyroid and I went to go get it checked out and I was told I had thyroid cancer. And of course, when you hear the C word, um, you're in, you're in sympathetic, you're in survival mode, right? So I ended up getting my thyroid cut out. I got high dose radiation, which was completely unnecessary. And I was sent on my way. There was no, the, you know, this is what happens, you know, when your body doesn't have the right food, this is what happens when your hormones are off. Nothing. The idea was that this is an easy thing to take care of. Why? Because they can cut out a vital organ and then they can put me on a pill, which that's what most people, that's how most people are dealing with thyroid hormones right now or, or thyroid issues yeah. is you have a thyroid issue, just put in this pill and that's it. But that pill never corrects anything. And so by the time I was about 20, uh, before I was 21, um, in that year, I started losing my menstrual cycle. I was weight loss resistant and <laughs> Back then, you know, I thought, okay, I got to be healthy. So I decided to be vegan um, and I was doing CrossFit. Wasn't changing anything for me, right? I was starting to struggle with depression and anxiety, which looked different, right? Depression to me looked like every day I, I would wake up with this heaviness that I couldn't shake. Even though I was thankful for my church, I was thankful. I, like I loved my life, but every day it was this heaviness I couldn't shake. And I was anxious at night. I would lay awake at night and replay things in my head that I had no control over. And I was 20 and I would go to my doctor and they would say that everything looked fine. My labs looked good. And in fact, I had one doctor try to explain to me when I told him I wasn't losing weight with all the working out I was doing. He said, uh, do you understand calories in calories out? Like you're obviously eating too much. Mm. And I was very restrictive. And so of course I left that doctor's office and decided to be a raw vegan. Cause I'm like, obviously I need to restrict, restrict, restrict. And the issue was that, number one, I wasn't trusting my body. I knew something was wrong. But when I sat across from a doctor, I, I let it all go, even though it didn't make sense to me. I would walk out of there. And even though I knew something was wrong, I just accepted what they said. My body's just this messed up machine, which is very scary to think about, because what was my health going to look like at 40 or 50 years old? Yeah. Um, and the second thing was the doctors weren't doing the right testing. They weren't doing the right labs. They were doing incomplete labs and they were putting the fault on me, even though they weren't doing the right things. And uh, I actually uh, went, I got into a car accident. I met with a doctor at chiropractic. And that's when I was first heard that principle is that the body created to heal itself. It does the right thing at all, at all times. So if it feels like it's not, then there's a stressor there that needs to be addressed. Mm. And so at 21, I drew a line in the sand and I said, uh, no more. No one's going to know my body better than me. I'm going to fire my doctor. I'm going to find a doctor. I'm going to advocate for myself. And that's when I looked at research. I'm obsessive with that. I still do that. Even now when I practice, I'm always looking at studies, always looking at research. And I decided I was going to take my health back into my own hands. And that's why I became a doctor of chiropractic because the body's created to heal itself. And I wanted to help people do that and do that the right way. And honestly, that was 17, uh, seven, 15 years ago, 16 years ago. Not much has changed. It's mm. all the same. Same thing. Incomplete labs. Synthroider. You know, armor thyroid is the answer. There is no change. And it's because medicine thinks, what's the point of changing it if it works? If it works. If mm -hmm. you get on Synthroid, it should work. They're not changing it. And more and more people are having thyroid disorder. And more and more people are being diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your story is really relatable. I see a lot of comments rolling in here. Maybe you have had your thyroid removed like Rebecca or you're on Synthroid and, you know, there's a lot of problems with it, but here's what I loved about your story. You made a decision to mm -hmm. take control over your health and take it away from conventional medicine and put it into the hands of innate. And here's the cool mm -hmm. thing about that. We all have that opportunity to make a decision and take ownership and control over your health and take it away from conventional sick care who's mm. making a lot of money from people being sick. Here's the truth of the matter. A cured patient is a lost customer. Why would they want to cure you? They can't get paid for it. They get bonuses yeah. for, for certain medications. So tomorrow, we're, uh, the group here, the Keto Kickstart group, you're going to have uh, an opportunity to make a decision and reclaim your health when we invite you to our, our group, which is the Keto Camp Academy. So it's just a decision. 
That's what it takes. And we teach the innate healing process. And here's where I want to now take the conversation, Rebecca. The flaws of conventional testing when it comes to thyroid medication. The gold standard, according to conventional doctors, you know this, TSH, thyroid mm -hmm. stimulating hormone. That's pretty much the only thing, maybe a couple other things they'll look for. But why is TSH not even a marker of thyroid health? That that's a really good question, or that's a really good you know point. TSH is a pituitary hormone. It can have a delay if there's a conversion issue. You know, one thing that you talk about that is not talked about ever within thyroid issues is cell receptor sensitivity when it comes mm. to thyroid hormones, right? You talk about that. We we know about it with blood sugar, but no one's saying, hey, guess what? It happens with all of your hormones, your thyroid hormones. So cell receptor sensitivity going down, your ability, liver congestion, liver issues, you know, with blood sugar stuff going on there, gallbladder issues, gut issues, you know, there's a lot of things down the line that TSH isn't going to pick up on until it's severe enough, right? It's a pituitary hormone. It is not a thyroid hormone. It is how the brain's communicating with your thyroid, right? So with conversion issues, if you have liver issues, gallbladder issues, gut issues, cellular membrane sensitivity issues, it's not going to always pick that up. It's not the gold standard anymore. And I, I'm sure you've talked about this. I talk about it a lot. You know, they did a study, you know, a while back and they're like, you know, or they kind of analyzed that and they're like, you know, how long does it take for information from research to make it into clinical practice? And it was over 17 years. Mm. That is if your doctor's keeping up to date on what, you know, newer studies are saying. But in the end, regardless of studies or no studies, if you have a patient in front of you and they're saying they're not well and they have all the symptoms of thyroid issues, it's time to change how you do things. A lot of doctors don't like that. They don't like change. <laughs> and they don't like you to question things, right? Yeah. Um, and in those situations, that's when you fire them. But TSH is a pituitary hormone. Um, and even this, so there's two issues with that. It's a pituitary hormone. So it might not, it's more sensitive to like a total T4, not your active T3. Uh, you know, that's the biggest thing. And the second thing is the ranges. The ranges are too broad. We have ranges depending on the company that you use that has TSH going to a 4.5 or a 5 across the board functionally. And in newer studies, there's a general consensus that it should be under a 2.5. Mm -hmm. And that is not even taking into consideration, like if there's women with fertility issues, I mean, fertility studies say that TSA should be under a one. So here you are going to a doctor, maybe having some fertility, miscarrying issues, things like that. And your TSH is a 3.5 and your doctor's just going off of what's on paper and not functional optimal limits and causing unnecessary damage, unnecessary issues there when it shouldn't be there. Mm. So TSH alone it's just not enough. It doesn't tell you very much at all. The ketogenic diet is all the craze these days. Rightfully so. Using keto could be a powerful way to achieve extraordinary health results. And if you're interested in keto, but just so confused by all the information out there, you're gonna wanna watch this video. If we're just meeting, my name is Ben Azadi. I am the best-selling author of four books, including my recent book, The Best-Selling Keto Flex Book. And I'm excited to share with you about a new, seven day keto kickstart challenge where I'm gonna reveal my four pillar framework to achieving long-term results with keto and fasting. This seven day challenge is 100% completely free. Me and the Keto Camp team are gonna teach you the blueprint that we've used to apply to thousands of our clients for amazing results. There's a lot of information out there and it's enough to leave you confused, conflicted, and paralyzed with your thought process. What we're gonna do is take all that clutter and cut through the noise and give you a simple step-by-step -step four pillar framework so you could achieve extraordinary results with your health. I really want this to be your healthiest and best year ever, and this challenge is going to help you accomplish that. So what I want you to do is click the link around this video here, learn more about this seven-day keto kickstart challenge, get signed up, and we'll see you in the seven-day keto kickstart challenge. It doesn't, and the reason that your conventional doctor only orders TSH and maybe a T4 and, and total T3 is because their treatment is the same. It's like they're not going to look at your liver or your gut, or maybe heavy metals and mercury and what's disrupting the receptor site sensitivity. So when Rebecca said 
receptor site sensitivity. For those of you who watched session two, Rebecca, I drew the cell for them, mm -hmm. Dr. Pompa style, right? What he's taught us. And I showed them those receptor sites. Hormones are, I remember when I showed it to y'all, you all did the exercise with me. Hormones are connecting to those receptor sites. T3 is one of them. And T3 is the active form of thyroid. It's used by every single one of your cells. There's a receptor site for all of them. T4 needs to be converted to T3. Mm -hmm. So um, what are your the recommended labs to get done? What are the, you don't have to get into the reference ranges per se, but what are the labs we should be getting from our doctor? Yeah, absolutely. So, so I'll go from above down. Um, and so, yeah, I still test TSH because, you know, in certain situations and in, in certain stressors, it's, it's a piece of the overall puzzle. It's not the answer, right? So I test TSH and then from the thyroid to look at thyroid output, I'm going to look at T4 because the thyroid's going to make predominantly T4. It makes some T3 and a little bit of T1 and T2, but that's a whole other conversation. But mostly T4 is going to be coming from the thyroid. So you'll get a better idea of more of thyroid hormone production and what's happening at the thyroid level by looking at your free T4, not total, because what you want to look at is if you're, uh, you know, if you if you have free available hormones to utilize. I'll give this caveat that I've changed here in the last year is that if you are on thyroid medication, I will sometimes, I will check total T4 because sometimes you're on a high dose of thyroid medication and not converting it. And you'll see your total, which means your bound up is going to go high. So that's the only time I'll really look at total T4s if you're on thyroid medication, but free T4. And then that free T4 goes to the liver, the gut. Those are the primary places, primarily in the liver, and you're going to get T3. So you have to test T3. Right now, the more um, up-to-date doctors will test TSH and T4, and that's it. And their idea is that if you have enough T4, your body will do what it needs to do with it. Yeah, and in a perfect, non-toxic, non-stressful, non-gut interrupting blood sugar balanced world. Yeah. But if you're in there and you have a thyroid issue, you probably have some other issues going on with different systems. So they assume that if you're making T4, if you're taking T4, your liver and your gut will take care of it. But you wouldn't believe how many times I sit across from people like in consults, like virtual consults and stuff. And I go, okay, so did your endocrinologist ask you about your digestive system? How often you're pooping, if it's, you know, constipation, if it's loose stools, acid reflux, gut issues. Oh, no, they didn't ask me. How about liver? Have they asked about your exposure to toxins, what your blood sugar is and all this? Nope, they've never asked those questions. Well, then how would they know that your body is capable of converting it efficiently if they've never asked those questions? So that's why they usually do just TSH and free T4 or total T4. But you want to get free T3. As you said, it binds to the cell. It's that active hormone. I will also test reverse T3. When that T4 goes into the liver, you're going to make a backup amount of reverse T3. And the purpose of making backup reverse T3 is in times of major stress or chronic stress. So it's a really good marker. I can look at that number and say, ooh, you're about to have like a thyroid storm or you're about to crash and burn because that reverse T3 is going, going, going up. Your T3 is going down. You have some serious stressors underneath, you know, like underneath the surface that needs to be addressed. And reverse T3 competes with free T3. You want to get that checked. Mm -hmm. You want to get that checked. Dr. Rebecca, what if my doctor doesn't check it because some insurances don't cover it? <laughs> then find another doctor or order it yourself. Yeah. Right? You got to get a full picture. Um, and then the last two is the thyroid antibodies, TPO antibodies, thyroglobin antibodies. Now, that's a whole nother conversation. I've, I know there's people here that have had Hashimoto's. That's the main reason for hypothyroidism. And Graves is an autoimmune disorder for hyperthyroidism. The test for that is TSI. I'll just throw it out there, TSI. But the problem with testing for thyroid antibodies in a medical world is that once you have it, there's not really a medication that they can give you that's going to bring it down. So the idea is that what's the point <laughs> in testing it? you have hypothyroidism. It is what it is. Or doctors will sometimes test it and then they don't test it again. So you can go from like 200 to a thousand, or even, even if you have like TPO antibodies in the 50 range, you have an autoimmune disorder. And so the problem is you need to know if you have an autoimmune disorder, because the problem there is that even though it's a thyroid antibody, 
It's an autoimmune disorder, which means it's a whole body immune issue that can affect your brain. Those antibodies cross the blood brain barrier. They can increase your chances of other autoimmune disorders. So even if you get on thyroid meds and you have that autoimmune disorder and it's not going down into remission, you are going to continue to have issues. Mm -hmm. And those are the complete labs. Yeah. So rewind this in case you didn't write them all down and write them all down and take them to your doctor. If your doctor says, I can't get all this, find another doctor. If you're in the academy, we could order it for you as well. Um, you could fi probably find some resources online to get it yourself. But it's very important to get the full picture uh, because as Dr. Rebecca Warren just explained, it's not just about TSH and T4. Is it converting? But uh, And the, the reverse T3 is really important too because and I would like for you to explain a little bit more, it, it mimics the same structure as T3 and it blocks yeah. T3 from getting in. So mm -hmm. could you explain that? And then why would innate do that? Why would innate create reverse T3 and block T3 from getting in? What's the reasoning behind that? That's that's a beautiful question. And I will say, I do have a thyroid lab ebook that just breaks down that's what right. I explained. Yeah. So if you guys want that little ebook, it explains the different labs uh, that you can order. Um, it's at drrebeccawarren.com for those labs. But Alina so will put the, that for you all in the, the notes there, the live stream chat. Go ahead. Yeah, 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 yes, absolutely. So when our body goes into survival mode, our, our we want to conserve energy, right? We want to make sure that we are putting energy where we need it. And so what reverse T3 does, it's a beautiful system in place that if we go into a famine and a war, if we're really sick and we end up in the hospital, it takes a lot of energy for the thyroid to make thyroid hormones. So in a way, what you'll see when you're chronically stressed is that your thyroid or a big stressor, your thyroid will kind of in a way conserve energy and slow down and kind of in a way shut down and not produce as much thyroid hormones. So your body's like, it's okay, because what we're going to do is because reverse T3 molecularly is so much like free T3, we're going to take this reverse T3 and make it available to use. It doesn't, it doesn't take a lot of energy. You can reactivate it into free T3. That's beautiful. You end up in the hospital. You've got COVID. You're fighting it off. Like It's great to have. But then the problem is what the body looks for for stress is that we're going to encounter stress. And then it's going to go away, right? The stressor is taken care of. It's removed. It's addressed. But what happens for a lot of people is they're continuing with that stressor, right? A famine or mold toxicity, a famine or stinking thinking, hmm. you know, like having negative thoughts, a famine or, you know, being too restrictive with your calories. Your body doesn't distinguish between the two. It doesn't say, oh, this person's just having negative thinking. It's not a famine. They're not in the hospital. It's okay. No, it's stress is stress is stress. And if those things aren't addressed, whatever that stressor is, that trigger is, what will end up happening is you'll start building up that reverse T3, then your thyroid will shut down. And then what will happen is you'll stop, make, you know, you're slow down or decrease making thyroid hormones. So then you start using your reverse T3 but you are still in this chronic state. You're not making the thyroid hormones. You're not replenishing reverse T3. So once your reverse T3 comes down too, you're done. Like you are fatigued, brain fog, memory issues, gut issues, gallbladder issues, all the symptoms of hypothyroidism is going to show up. And I'm talking about hypo because that's the most common one, but it has the same type of effect with hyperthyroidism. Mm -hmm. So reverse T3 is a great protective mechanism, but under chronic stress, it can cause more symptoms and more issues and how you're feeling inside of your body. Yeah, makes total sense. Uh, innate knows what it's doing. So reverse T3 will be elevated from a stressor. And like Rebecca just said, that stressor could be mental, emotional, thinking, thinking, relationship stress, work stress, watching too much news. Don't do that. <laughs> could be physical stress, like uh, an injury, a car accident, giving birth is a physical stress. And then it could be chemical toxicity, which we spoke about the other day, heavy metals, mold, et cetera. So, uh, you know, the interesting thing about giving birth, that you have all three of those stressors, don't you? There's a chemical <laughs> yeah, release, it's, there's yeah. an emotional <laughs> and a physical stressor, huh? <laughs> yeah. And that's why, you know, I'll tell you what, man, I always have a lot of empathy with people that are in their health journey. Um, because listen, if I can help in any way, have someone avoid losing their thyroid, um, 
God, it would be worth it because it sucks. Let me be real with you. It sucks losing a vital organ like that because you're right. Every time I give birth, my body's like, what is going on? Because it's such a, it's a good stress. Your body should respond to that. But if your thyroid, your thyroid is not ready and if it's not prepared or you don't have one, recovery and bouncing back is not the easiest journey, even though, you know, you can prepare yourself and kind of get back on track, but it's not easy. Yeah. So do everything you can to support not needing thyroid medication, needing as little as you need and everything you can to not sit in a doctor's office and hear that you have thyroid cancer, you have these thyroid issues and needing to cut out your thyroid. You don't want to be there. And unless you're doing something differently than everyone else, you, whether male or female, can end up in that doctor's office and hear that same thing. Yeah. And and please, if you're taking thyroid medication, this is not uh, coaching yeah. you to get off of it, right? This is not medical yeah. advice. You would work with the coach and there's different options like desiccated mm -hmm. thyroid and different dosages. But the goal is to remove the interference. So there is, yeah. uh, the thyroid is able to function better. And that brings me to keto and fasting. Uh, you mentioned one of the big things for thyroid hormone and all hormones are sense, uh, receptor site sensitivity. And mm -hmm. we know that the way we teach keto, the way we teach fasting is a fantastic, incredible way to downregulate membrane inflammation to create more sensitive hormones. But we also know that fasting and keto when you do it too long can be stressful. And if you're already mm -hmm. under too much stress, what's the balancing act? Why are there, why are there yeah. people saying you should never do keto and fasting if you have uh, thyroid issues? Yeah. So first let me talk about why it's so amazing <laughs> because I will be real, real with you. I did um, keto and fasting. I called it something different. We called it this advanced, you know, way of eating, but anyways, um, and it was the first time that I was able to decrease for someone with no thyroid to be able to decrease their thyroid medication and still feel amazing was like, oh my gosh, this is fantastic. And so one thing we need to take into consideration is that a big place that T3 works is in the mitochondria. It is needed and necessary, you know, within like ATP production um, and mitochondrial health and thyroid health go hand in hand. It's, it's really, really important, and especially mitochondrial health in the thyroid. It's being bombarded by toxins and fluoride and chlorine and heavy metals and all of that. So getting into a place of ketosis is incredible because I, this is what I was going to say. Like a few years ago, I would have people come in and their thyroid was completely like on, on paper, their hormones were not good, like at all. But it was the first time that they were losing weight. It was the first time that they had energy. And I'm just like, you know, previously I can admit I wouldn't have put someone in ketosis if they were like that. And so I started looking deeper into why is it that if even if you have a thyroid issue, you can start to see these really great metabolic changes, which T3 is associated with good metabolism. And it's because ketone bodies, utilizing ketone bodies for energy is more efficient for ATP production. Mm -hmm. And you don't need uh, more T3 to process all these carbs because you need a more T3 with more carbs that you're consuming. You actually, in a way, give your thyroid a break while still producing the energy that you need efficiently to be well and to be metabolically well. And so I use that, you know, we use that getting into ketosis as kind of giving your body, your thyroid a break. Um, and then while you can work on your, your thyroid and fasting is incredible because stem cells and autophagy and mTOR and all that good stuff, which now we know we have different types of stem cells within the thyroid. Mm. And that's amazing because if you have Hashimoto's or Graves disease, you can get thyroid tissue destruction. And how amazing is it to think that by repairing the cell, creating stem cells, you can regenerate good, healthy cells to take over the thyroid, which is I will tell you this, you go to your endocrinologist and you say that to them, they're going to think you're crazy. <laughs> they're going to be like, not possible. But it is, and we see that there's these adult stem cells and these baby stem cells, so it's really amazing. But the problem then is, remember what I said about reverse T3, it's a good stressor until it no longer is. When your body starts to notice that it's chronically in a state where it should not be, it's going to conserve energy. And so... Number one, going too long without refeeding insulin, having some good insulin response kind of increases T4 to T3 conversion and in a way resets it. It kind of lets your body know like, hey, we're good. 
uh, this isn't a serious, you know, permanent thing. Here's some good insulin or some good healthy carbs and kind of wakes up that system and then creates this kind of feedback loop where their body's like, okay, oh yeah, refeed, we're restoring, we're resetting, and then you can get back into ketosis. But the other, the main thing, honestly, in blogs and TikToks and whatever about people saying that you shouldn't do keto, you shouldn't do fasting is because T4 conversion into T3 does go down. Mm -hmm. It goes down. And so they look at studies and they say, or they look at information and they say, look at this, T4 uh, into T3 goes down. Your T3 goes down. That's not good. And you need carbs to maintain your T3. Well, what they're saying is, hey, your body's this stagnant system. It can't adapt to different environments. Your number has to stay the same at all times, which is false. We're dynamic. We're adaptive. If we're under stress, if we're not under stress, if we're eating more, if we're feasting, if we're doing more famine, we will adapt. And that's with all of our hormones. So it's crazy to think that getting in ketosis is a bad thing because your body is adapting. Because mm -hmm. when you refeed, when you appropriately refeed, right, it goes right back. Mm -hmm. It goes right back. So the idea is that just because T3 goes down doesn't mean it's a bad thing. And a lot of studies, there are a lot of studies looking at patients like that are overweight, obesity studies, studies with like nutrition where if they lose a lot of weight, they get better and they see a decrease in T3. And in those studies, they're like, oh, we have decrease of T3. Like I've come across a few obesity studies and they're like, but they don't look at it as a bad thing. They're like, oh, obviously that has to happen to lose weight for them to be well. But when we look at ketosis and fasting, if it goes down, they think it's this bad dysfunctional thing when it's that not. Makes sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, because well, a part of that is the sensitivity is going up. The receptor yes. sensitivity is going up. And yeah, your cell receptor sensitivity is going up. You're becoming more efficient using fat for fuel, less need for all this T4 to T3 conversion. Honestly, we've needed a lot more T3 in this modern day and age because of how much carbs we're consuming. Like mm. on a daily basis over and over again, we've actually been overworking our thyroid. Your body's going to be so thankful to have a break from that. Mm -hmm. Finally. Yeah. Again, ketosis. So that's the magic is in the, in the, what I call keto flexing. It's in going in and out of ketosis. Um, and I'm going to talk more about that on Monday ses session seven. We're going to take a deep dive into keto flexing, but I want you to get more into fasting. You mentioned autophagy, mTOR, stem cells, adult stem cells, baby stem cells. And this is how incredible that innate intelligence is, right? When you, when you take food out of the equation for a certain period of time, let's say 16 hours, you haven't eaten anything, you're just having water, you haven't given your body any caloric energy. Innate thinks the innate intelligence, whoa, you know, famine. Um, we're probably mm -hmm. going through a famine. It doesn't understand that we have Uber Eats and DoorDash and supermarkets automatically genetically hardwired to turn on this process. So the innate intelligence looks for cells that are inflamed, that are what's called senescent cells, damaged cells, damaged mitochondria, and it goes and it starts to attempt to repair it. But then it goes a, a step further. Let's say it's repairing some of those uh, thyroid cells. Uh, and it determines that this cell is not functioning at all. It's highly inflamed. There is no benefit. It sends a signal. Innate sends a signal to get rid of the cell via apoptosis. And then it produces a stem cell. And that stem cell, if the innate wants it to be used for the thyroid, sends it to the thyroid or to the liver or to the brain. So talk more about fasting and how it's such a powerful ancient healing strategy to fix some of the damage we've been doing by overfeeding ourselves. Yeah. And so, you know, one, one really big thing going back to like some of the biggest issues that we're seeing with thyroid disorders is an autoimmune disorder and then heavy metal, like mm -hmm. toxicity disorder. Those are like the two biggest issues. And so one thing that happens is that when you're looking at when you're looking at autoimmune disorders, so I had seen a comment kind of here on the side is like, you can get hypothyroidism or, or hyperthyroidism, right? Where you're making too much thyroid hormones or too little and both be an autoimmune issue. But what can happen is that this, your immune system, these, you know, immune cells will go in and attack your thyroid tissue. And in a way it does kill them off. There's a lot of inflammation there it will kill off those cells, damage those cells. And then as your cells start to die off, you can have like 
a dump of thyroid hormone. So it feels like you're going hyper and then it feels like you're going hypo. Like you have all these like random symptoms. And then what ends up happening is that's when you start to see, you can see a lot of people here have no idea that their thyroid is getting destroyed until they like get an ultrasound. There's an endocrinologist here who does ultrasounds all the time. And I've heard him say this multiple times, but he's looking at these people's thyroid and they're like, it looks like a dog chewed up your thyroid. Mm. It looks like a dog. Like yeah. that's literally like these cells are dying off. They're damaging off. And you're there. You're not really getting any information about the idea that you can regenerate cells, that you can regenerate this tissue by working on healing at a cellular level and then increasing stem cells. And so again, fasting, like as you explain, one of the most beautiful things it can do is it's restorative in that nature. It's clearing out, it's getting rid of, and then it's increasing stem cells. And this is why you should do it. I heard someone say from the stage, they're like, okay, I love using studies. I love like seeing what's out there, but you know what? Screw that. Because what I want to do is I want to live a life. I want to have a group of people like you. I know Ben, you feel this way that are living in such a way that people want to study what you're doing, right? Mm -hmm. People want to see, well, this is happening. Why is it happening? Because right now I started a couple months ago, I started looking at studies with stem cells, like, oh my gosh, adult stem cells, what does this mean? And to me, with our background with fasting, it's this is incredible. It means you have the opportunity to not only regenerate those cells, regenerate the thyroid, but possibly come off of it, come off a of thyroid medication um, and not need it. But in the study, it literally says, it, it just planned out, it just said, you know, but right now we have a good approach to dealing with thyroid issues. So What's pretty much what's the point of looking into this further? Wow. What's the point of seeing adult stem cells outside of cancer research? What's what's the point of looking at regeneration if, you know, we have a good thing going for us? And what's the good thing? Taking Synthroid, which doesn't do anything for tissue, doesn't do anything for autoimmunity, doesn't do anything for conversion, doesn't do anything for underlying issues. It just puts in the end product. So it make a lot of money. And make, yeah, and make a lot. I mean, Synthroid is one of the top up there with statin medication and antidepressants prescribed medication because the idea is it's easy. What's the point? But with fasting, we see that. We know the stem cells are there. We can see what fasting does. You now get to set what's possible, not your doctor, not some study, not, you know, what you read. You get to say, hey, I know the science is here. I know my body's created to heal itself. And now you get to do it and see that happen in your own health and in your own life. Mm, so good. I love that. We're going to, we're going to take some time in a few minutes to do VIP Q and a in about five minutes. One more question for you, Rebecca, before we do Q and a is what would be a general, I know it's going to be more specific to the person and their goals and their health conditions and history, but what'd be a general fasting schedule for somebody who has an underactive thyroid? Ooh, this is really good. So if I'm working like with hormone related fasting, I actually, and especially with women, I'm going to point this out. Sorry, guys, with women, I would focus on first making sure that women, um, especially if they have hormone issues, know how to eat enough before I start them fasting. Um, so my fasting starts off with nourishment. Um, because what I find, especially if you have sex hormone issues and thyroid hormone issues, is that you will, for a lot of people, they will be too restrictive for too long because they're not losing weight mm -hmm. because their thyroid is off. Yeah. So they'll be too restrictive for too long. And so how I started off is, you know, first, you know, do keto. Um, I will push for high protein, high fat, yep. um, and then make sure they understand and they actually track their macros. That's the only time I will have people track their macros because they don't realize how little they're eating or how little protein they're eating her little fat they're eating. And so I would start them off on just the basic 16, eight for a couple of weeks to make sure that they are where they need to be. And also with the 16, eight, you know, that's very conducive in helping with uh, melatonin and cortisol, um, staying in that circadian way of eating. So once they've established themselves, I kind of test it to see if their body is ready for it. Because for a lot of people, that have a thyroid issue and they just jump straight into fasting, they get really frustrated because they're not seeing all the amazing results that everyone else is. When it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, your hormones are 
crazy. It's going to take longer. Let's take a moment. Yeah. But so then from there, I will introduce one dinner to dinner fast for a couple of weeks. If they can go through that dinner to dinner fast, feeling good, you know, do that for about three weeks, feeling good, doing the 16 a one dinner to dinner fast. I will jump right in and then set them up for a three day water fast to reset. Mm. Kind of just jump right in. So I, for anyone that wants to reset those hormones, that's kind of the path I take. And I, I like if your body's ready and you're in that metabolic state to get you into a three day water fast. Um, also be aware. I, I know we've discussed this as well. If you're on thyroid medication, that second into third day, you might feel kind of kooky. You might feel kind of hyper symptoms. And for a lot of people, you're taking more medication than you need. So when those cell receptor sensitivity, you know, increases, when you're using ketone bodies, a lot of people will associate too much thyroid medication with having an adverse reaction to fasting when in naturality, it's because you were always on too much. Yeah. And now your body's using it. And it's like, this is this is a lot. So a lot of times look at that first and saying, I mean, so fasting's making me have anxiety or panic attacks. If you're having anxiety, panic attacks, feeling overwhelmed, overheated, it's usually associated because of your thyroid meds. That's that's really good. So just to recap what you just said, uh, increase your healthy fats, increase your protein, make sure you're not under eating, especially protein, which is perfect because what they're doing here in this group is the two, 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 two rule from Dr. Pompa, right? Eating all these healthy fats, at least for the seven days of the challenge, but 14 days would be even better. And then we're focusing on that protein requirement, which, uh, I gave them one gram of protein, pro one gram of protein per pound of your ideal. Mm -hmm. body. So mm -hmm. if your goal is to weigh 120 pounds to hit that 120 grams of animal based protein, not, not vegetarian or plant based, but animal based protein. And then mm -hmm. you start doing things like a 16, eight, uh, a 24 hour fast. And on Monday, I'm going to be going over the 511 rule and more about what you just mm -hmm. shared. But fasting is so powerful to, mm -hmm. uh, we haven't even touched the surface on all the benefits of fasting, yeah. but specifically for the thyroid and what it does to just harness that innate intelligence. It, it should be used um, really, really wisely. It's a tool, like a chainsaw is a tool. You got to learn how to use the chainsaw. Otherwise you could hurt yourself. So that's why this is important to kind of get direction here. Anything else you want to add before we get to the Q and A, Rebecca? Um, yeah, the last thing I will add is that like the number one question I get asked, I have a group for people that are healing after thyroidectomy that had their thyroid removed. And the thing I keep hearing over and over again, well, my doctor won't order my labs or my doctor won't let me then fire them. Like <laughs> don't stick with someone that's not helping you. Yeah. Like we put more, you know, work into like finding a good mechanic for our cars than doing the research on our doctors. Mm. It's a process. Fire them, move on to someone new. That can be such a, a, a big change for you. But yeah. Well said, yeah, you know, cut them out, find somebody who will work with you. I mean, work with mm -hmm. Dr. Rebecca Warren. Uh, not yeah. only is she in Tennessee, so if you live in Tennessee, you can go to her practice, but she works virtually. And um, her website is uh, drswarren.com. What is it? Dr. Rebecca Warren.com. Dr. Rebecca Warren.com. It'll go directly to my. And you also have your podcast, uh, yeah. which is the Thyroid List Life podcast, right? Yes. Yeah. Thyroid List Life. So, Living uh, without a thyroid. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what you're doing. So you can go listen to it. It's not just about how to live a life without no. a thyroid. It's all about thyroid and just innate healing. So let's get to these questions. Um, yeah. Hi. 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 Thanks for all that you've talked about today. Absolutely. I appreciate it. Every time I get checked for my thyroid, of course, everything is okay. Um, first of all, does age matter? Um, no, um, I will say no. I will say in studies, like they'll say like people that are over 60 all have kind of like one or two nodules, but I would go deeper in saying it's probably because we're living in a more and more toxic world. Nodules are going, they're an adaptive process, right? So yeah, you're probably going to have, you're more than likely to have nodules showing up on your thyroid as you get older. Um, but what's possible and what's not possible. I mean, I had a, a, how old was she? She was 85 years old and the doctors just wrote off her fatigue and her tiredness because they're like, well, you're getting older. Your thyroid starts shutting down. I was like, but she has symptoms and we were able to get her to more optimal dose and felt amazing. And she did a five day water fast. So no. <laughs> Ages, wow. Yeah. She felt amazing. It was great. So 
don't let that restrict you on what's well, possible. Well, just recently, I started doing the hormone replacement pellets. I take it that's not something that you really condone. Um, that it can be fixed. So I can give you a little disclaimer. I cannot tell you what to do or not to do. With okay. Medication. I don't prescribe medication, but this is my problem with as we age for both men and women. Uh, but let me just touch with women because you're here, right? So pre, you know, before menopause, most of our sex hormones are coming from our ovaries. And as we transition into perimenopause, it isn't like this straight, like we're done with our ovaries. Usually perimenopause can be a year to over 10 years. And what's happening is some days you make more estrogen, other days you make less. It should be like riding a kitty roller coaster. But most women before going into perimenopause, before going into menopause, already have some sex hormone issues with estrogen and adrenal issues. So when they go into perimenopause, instead of having some estrogen or little estrogen, they have these big spikes and crashes, spikes and crashes. You see hot flashes, you see vaginal dryness, you see weight gain and all these things. And then you get into menopause. And this is my biggest frustrating thing that just pisses me off is that when you go into menopause, first of all, it's not a disease process. It's not your body's doing something wrong, right? Like it's a natural process. It's a right. new season. You don't have to menstruate. You know how much energy you're saving and your body loves fat. Like you should have a great sex drive. You should be traveling. But we've been sold on this idea that, you know, menopause sucks. Why? Because you go from all of your sex hormones coming from your ovaries to all of your sex hormones coming from your adrenals. Your adrenals make DHEA, DHEA to testosterone, testosterone to estrogen, and then DHEA to progesterone. So the problem is before you go into menopause, a lot of you guys, you're in a very sympathetic state, survival mode, high cortisol, low cortisol. So when you go to your OBGYN, do they look at your adrenal health? Do they look at HPA axis? No. So what they do instead is they leave you in this very sympathetic, stressful state, and then they put in that synthetic hormone. Uh, you know, there are there are more cleaner versions like bioidentical hormones and stuff like that. But if That's your what body, is. what was that? That's what it is. Okay, so bioidentical. But yeah. this is the thing. Why are you there? Why aren't you producing enough? How is your adrenal health? How is your HPA access? And on top of that, you have to be able to clear out that estrogen. So if your body's stressed out, now you're just putting in the end hormone that can make you feel better if you're on the right amount, but the problem's never addressed. And for most women in menopause, it's this HPA access. It's years of rushing, 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 maybe having underlying thyroid hormone issues. How many women have had menstrual cycle issues where doctors are like, oh, just have a hysterectomy or get on birth control or just deal with it. And then you're left to kind of suffer through menopause. So HPA access is going to be really, really important um, in menopause when it comes to hormones. Thank you very much. Yeah, you're very, very welcome. Thank you, Lynn. Awesome. Great, great feedback. Okay. There's a few more questions here I'm going to ask you directly. But Erica says, Erica Ward says, how do you address carb slash sugar addiction? I'm afraid to go off keto because my cravings come back and I can't control my cravings. I've been keto for 3.5 years with zero cheats. Just thinking about flexing out of ketosis, giving me literal nightmares of binging and losing control again. So I always say, you know, there's always an underlying issue. It's not that there's something wrong with you. There's probably an underlying issue that's making you more prone to be drawn to that. Let me kind of give you a, a few examples. If you're kind of naturally low in progesterone, which low progesterone issues goes unaddressed in women all the time. It's PMS symptoms. It's, you know, if you had menstrual cycle, it can be disrupted sleep. It can be increased anxiety. It can be increased depression. Um, that's very cyclical and you don't know it unless your doctor has you track it. So if you are more deficient in progesterone output, you're going to be more drawn to carbs. You're going to be more drawn to getting those carbs in to helping that HP access so that more progesterone can be released, especially if you've done it chronically. So it could be a progesterone thing. There's also gut infections, right? We know with studies that when there's gut imbalances, whether there's overgrowth of certain bacteria or if there's bacterial insufficiencies, that you're going to be more prone to carbs, going to be more drawn to a candida as well, certain um, like H, H. pylori, small intestinal bowel overgrowth. You're going to be more drawn to the foods that are going to feed those pathogens. 
So in situations like that, you know, the one thing I try to help people disconnect from is that there's not something wrong with you. It's not something wrong with you here. It's not something broken inside of you, but there's something that still needs to be addressed. And that's a good thing. That means that, heck, that thing that needs to be addressed that draws you more to those carbs, it's probably affecting other things that you just manage and you didn't know that they were going to be connected. So the idea is that if your body is resistant to good, healthy carbs, uh, we need to go deeper. Look at that gut, the digestive system, look at your sex hormones, look at what's going on. I, I tend to see those two big major areas um, and address that. And then don't be fearful, right? If you're addressing something, you have to have hope that things can be different. Your body's always listening to that messaging, right? I understand for a long time, I had really bad issues with food because I you know, was fasting and doing keto. And the idea of feeling full scared me because I, I felt if I felt full, then I was too much. I'm going to gain weight and all this stuff. On that healing process, you just have to continue to have hope that it's possible. They, women have done it before. Men have done it before. You can do it. We just got to figure, you just got to figure out what's that underlying, what's the underlying thing that's pushing you more towards, towards that. Cause I think there's something innate too about that. We, and that's why I don't like saying food is medicine or food is good or bad because you shouldn't feel bad about wanting to eat a banana or heck, if you go to New York city and you have a pizza, like the idea is that your body should be able to be well enough to adapt to that. Mm -hmm. And you're just not there yet. We just need to figure out what the underlying thing is. Yeah, well said. And Erica, you're in the academy. So there's different ways um, to do a, a keto flex day, right? There's there's what we could call crutches, meaning like it could be just a high protein caloric day with like just feasting all day. And as you work on the other things that Rebecca was kind of hinting, mm -hmm. towards, then we could introduce a little bit of some maybe low glycemic uh, berries or something like that. But there's different ways to do it. And we'll coach you on that. A good test for you to get, Erica, and anybody else who wants to look at their hormones is a Dutch test, mm -hmm. a D-U-T-C-H test. It's a urine test. Um, again, if you're in the academy, we could order it for you. Maybe ask your doctor first. Uh, one more question before we let Rebecca go, and then I'll get to the rest of the questions. Helen says, I'm on thyroid medication, Synthroid, and not on the right dose. She would like to stop taking the Synthroid. So it's not really a question, but what, what advice would you give to her maybe to communicate with her doctor about? Yeah. Okay. So a few things just to kind of, I'll just do some bullet points just really quick. Number one, um, if you're not on the right dose, what it looks like to change the dose is you have to change the dose and then give it, it's about six weeks for those hormones to normalize. And then you want to retest. So a lot of doctors will change your dose and then see you in two to three months. That's insane. That's two to three months of you suffering through. And so the idea is that you're a bio individual, how much you are going to need is unique to you, but doctors don't see you that way. They kind of, for the most part, say like, oh, most people need 60 or 90, you know, micrograms are like Synthroid. And so they keep you there, but you have to be able to advocate how you feel and how you function, not just what's on the paper. We talked about cell receptor sensitivity. If your sensitivity is down, you might need more meds in your situation um, than someone else, but your doctor might look at your labs and say, no, we can't do this. Go off of how you feel. Make sure you're retesting regularly if you're messing with the dose. Um, the next the next bullet point is that T Synthroid is only T4. So right. if you have a conversion issue and you don't have enough T3, you might need a combo. You might need T4, T3, um, which can be an armor thyroid I don't love it because it has fillers that tend to be, that have gluten and dairy. It's a small amount, but it's a small amount every single day. I think that can be problematic, but you can do like a Cytomel or a Tyrosin. You might need a T4, T3 combination. Um, and the last point is there is no direct dosing. Like, like I said, how much Synthroid do you need is up to you. But if you're going from Synthroid to Armor, I have people that say, oh my gosh, I tried armor. I tried T4, T3 and it was horrible and I didn't do well. Well, it's because you never, you never dosed it to where you needed to be. There is no direct, like T, if you take this much of Synthra, take this much of armor. It's not, you have to start at a certain dose and keep increasing it. And unfortunately, a lot of doctors like to start low and increase it very small which can mean you might be in a state of not feeling that great longer. But once you get to that right dose, it's, it's a really big thing.
just know that you're dynamic and you're an individual and to retest often. That's good. She says that's super helpful. Thank you. Um, Rebecca, share again, your website, your podcast, yes. your social media for them to go check you out. Absolutely. So Dr. Rebecca Warren.com um, is the website, Dr. Rebecca Warren on Instagram, and then my thyroid list life podcast. And then on my, on my website, you can see like the podcast um, and the ebook, the, I have a gallbladder one. And then I have like a, a lab ebook that you can check out on my website um, and submit any questions and stuff like that, that you might have on there, but that's how you can find me. Awesome. Um, we're so grateful for you and your brilliance and expertise. Thank you. Um, we wish you a happy, healthy birth. And we're so thank grateful you. for your knowledge. You blessed us all today. So thank you, Rebecca. Feel free to, to sign off and say hello to Nathan for me as well. Will do. Bye, guys.